today to talk about uh, our favorite subjects, the entertainment industry, uh, and how uh, to have a roadmap for a business career in television and film. Uh, we've assembled a group today that I think are, is very interesting, that has a myriad of backgrounds and experiences that I think will really be helpful to you. And I think surprising in a lot of ways in terms of how they began their careers in the entertainment industry. I, for example, um, was a labor union organizer who happened to meet someone that worked in television, uh, who worked for uh, Norman Lear, the television producer. And some of you are young and may not even know who Norman Lear is. But I'm sure that you've heard of All in the Family, the Jeffersons, different strokes, one day at a time. Those were all programs that were produced by Norman Lear. So that's how I received my, my um, entree into the entertainment industry. And while I was working for Norman, um, Norman started an awards program in conjunction with the National Conference of Christians and Jews as a way to change media portrayals of Latinos in television and film. And that was what was now become the Imagen Awards and ultimately became the Imagen Foundation. And I'm here as the president of the Imagen Foundation. And we're, again, very, very pleased and thankful that to Montgomery College for inviting us here. Um, my panelists today um, are, um, to my left, Julio Obscura, who is an intern currently at PBS. Um, oh, Julio is a graduate of Texas and a and International University with a degree in communications and journalism. Uh, he hopes to pursue uh, a career in Middle Eastern studies and communications uh, in radio and film. Um, he wants to eventually join the Peace Corps. But currently, he's uh, interning at PBS uh, in Crystal City. Um, next to Julio is Julio, as I like to say, Julio number two. Julio Garcia, who currently serves as Vice President of Human Resources and Operations for Jerry Bruckheimer Films and Jerry Bruckheimer Television. Uh, and in his role, he oversees all human resources, as well as IT archives, facilities, security, parking, and housekeeping. Um, Gar uh, Julio began his career um, as a, um, uh, at Pacific Park, a family amusement park, uh, which is famous for the Santa Monica Pier in California. And he got his big break at, when he attended a job fair sponsored by Imagen, uh, where he was hired to be um, an assistant in an, a human resources for MTV uh, networks. Uh, he left there and went back into hospitality working for Hilton when he just couldn't stand being away from entertainment, came back. And um, he came back as director of Nouveau TV, which is a premier English language cable network geared towards la the Latino community and backed by Jennifer Lopez, uh, who now serves as a creative officer there. And while he was there, he um, had an opportunity to move on and become Vice President of HR for Jerry Bruckheimer. And so Imahen is especially very proud of Julio and his accomplishments. And he was recently featured in Hispanic Executive Magazine. Next to Julio is another friend, Monica Hill. Monica is the Senior Vice President and General Manager of Multicultural Growth and Strategies for Nielsen. Many of you know the Nielsen ratings. Well, that's Nielsen. In her role, Monica, is responsible for driving growth, providing superior market understanding, and delivering comprehensive strategies to reach diverse consumer segments. <clears throat> Excuse me. Monica joined Nielsen in 2005 and previously held the position of Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Government Relations. As a thought leader and marketing strategist, Monica builds cross-cultural connections across Nielsen and their clients, focusing on innovative, and breakthrough approaches to multicultural intelligence. Monica currently serves on the National Board of Directors of uh, the Girl Scouts of America and is a member of the Latino Advisory Panel to the Kennedy Center. Then we have Ada Rodriguez. Some of you may recognize Ada if you watched last Comic Standing. She was the ninth Comic Standing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ada, um, as edgy, raw, and in-your-face style of comedy, has set her apart in a world that celebrates funny over double standards. As a single mom of two, Ada has honed and nurtured her craft while judging the daily grind and stresses of a family and career. 
while providing endless material, family remains in the heart of Ada Rodriguez's experience. Suddenly, the pages of my journal have become a laughing matter, she says. Um, this year, Ada hosted the 29th annual Imahan Awards, which aired on PBS. And she is currently working on, and it currently is in discussions for her own television show. So that's our panel. Um, so I'd like to start the discussion uh, with Julio. Um, and Julio, can you please kind of tell us some, a, a little bit about your background and, and uh, how you arrived at PBS? Definitely. Okay, so hi everybody. I hope everybody's doing very well. Um, I, I was, let me tell you about my background. I was born in Mexico City. Um, and uh, I come from a very uh, strong Catholic family. So at some point in my life when I was living in Mexico City, I was thinking of becoming a priest. So I was going to, to seminary school at some point. Um, but my life changed one day when um, my dad arrived home with my brother, uh, w holding my brother. And um, he was pale white uh, and very scared. And he right there and there decided that we're moving to the US uh, because uh, he got robbed uh, for the sixth time and they stole his car. And he, he just couldn't continue doing this anymore and he, we immigrated to the United States. Um, my mom's American, so it was easier for us to, to live in the United States. Um, I was 10 when I moved uh, to, to the US and uh, uh, I, I've always been uh, very involved and uh, have a huge curiosity on uh, film and photography. I was always one of those kids that grabbed the camera and picked it up and started to take pictures and make movies. I, when I first came up with uh, softwares how to make movies, I, I, I was so happy, I was so thrilled, that I, and it just has grown into a huge passion. So uh, what I put a little bit of uh, slides together um, because I'm a, a person that strongly, strongly believes on visuals. I think visuals uh, create uh, statements uh, and facts. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you. OK. So for me, everything started my freshman year of college. Um, this was the picture that changed my life. Um, I was fortunate enough that my freshman year in college, I uh, I, I got picked, um, I was chosen to, um, in a program called the Reading the Globe Ambassadors, uh, where I, I meet an author of a book, uh, write an essay, and I talk about how it could change the world. And uh, the book was A Long Way Gone by Ishmael Bea, and talks about child soldiers um, in Sierra Leone. Uh, this was a privilege, because I was able to travel to the places, uh, to the places where the place, uh, I mean, where the book takes place. Um, so I went and did a couple of research and uh, interviewed people um, on the, on the, on the subject of child soldiers. And one day, uh, I was. Uh, they took us to to a place called the Last Bath, where I took this picture. This is the Last Bath. This is the place where. Um, the, the slaves took their last bath, and after that, they would take them to uh, Cape Coast Castle and bring them to the New World. But there was something about this kid that was just sitting down and playing with the water. Um, but there was, there's so much to be said, I think, and, 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 the, and the history of it, of just that one place. Um, so this was the picture that started all, and that's when I found out that I really like photography and film. I could tell stories with that. Um, after that experience, uh, I decided to study abroad. <laughs> um, and I was fortunate enough to study one year in, uh, in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland, where I studied and focused on film. Um, and it was at this point where uh, I was open to the world. And I traveled to over 40 countries, North, uh, North Africa, Asia, uh, all over Europe. And, uh, this is when I realized that one life is not enough. I think um, there's so many beautiful things outside for us to learn and, and, and take advantage of, but one life is definitely not enough to see the world. Um, then, um, when I, after, I got, uh, after living in Edinburgh, Scotland, I 
uh, I was asked to become a mentor uh, for, for uh, sophomore and freshman students. And uh, I got the opportunity to become a mentor to the new cohort that went to that same program that I was chosen in my freshman year. And they took, this t they took us this time to Turkey. Uh, and this, is, this was the time that I was able to give back. But this was the first time, which I thought was pretty cool, it was the first time that I got paid to travel and do a video. <laughs> so that was awesome. Uh, and I was able to do a film about the program. And uh, so throughout the, all these years, I've been able to, to uh, make my portfolio stronger and stronger. Um, and then last year, um, I uh, ended up studying abroad uh, again. <laughs> Uh, you could tell really, I got the trouble bug. Um, I, I studied in Morocco, uh, in the town called Ifran, which is, uh, I don't know if you guys know, but is uh, Le Petit Suisse. It's the, it's the only place in North Africa where it snows. And it snows very, very much. Um, and this was the time where I realized that I had to <laughs> put, what's next? Like, what, am I going to work now? It's been school, it's been fun, but what am I going to do now? So this is when I decided to apply for uh, the HACU program, uh, which set up internship for me, uh, and I, this is how I landed in PVS. Um, and all these experiences have built me up, so if I could recommend something, it's definitely study abroad, but do stuff within your field that could help you out. In my case, it was film photography. If I could, excuse me, just tell, tell them what HACU is. HACU. So HACU is a Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities. For Latinos, actually it's open to, to everybody, but they focus more on, on Latinos. Uh, um, you apply to this program, they set you up in uh, corporations of federal agencies to do an internship. This is what, and actually I was very lucky, I was lucky enough that this was the only program that I applied to and they actually got in. So they called me from PBS uh, and offered me to work at post-production where uh, I did a video. Um, and which I'm about to show you now. This internship has been really great because I've learned a lot of things that I don't think I would have learned otherwise. Coming here, I realized there's so much more to PBS than just the children's programming. My name is Brittany Peters. My name is Jordan Coggins. Hello, I'm Lance Calloway. Hello, my name is Jasmine Posca Jones, and I'm an intern in the Professional Development Program. Hi, I'm Nicolette Toronto. I'm a PBS intern in PBS Kids Children's Programming and Development. I am the web design intern for the PBS Spy team. I work for the Station Products and Innovations team as the Marketing and Communications intern. I work for PBS Learning Media, and each day I am adjusting a variety of resources, whether it's a lesson plan or a video, and making sure that I write correct learning objectives for each object. It's also been really great because I've learned that it's okay to be kind of goofy and creative in the workplace, and that helps to come up with a lot of really great ideas. Working with people who love their work and who have amazing morals and they support family, they support education. You get to see what PBS does for the community with its content. It's a very good feeling to be able to know that we're doing something more than just making good TV, we're also making a positive contribution. I've always loved working with media, I want to work in television someday. It's just really fun people, it's a fun, playful environment, and it's definitely a creative space, so I'm never like afraid to present my ideas. As an art major, I like to be creative, so here I get to create all the graphics that I want to do and build my portfolio. Uh, so I've gained a real hands-on knowledge of what it's like to work in a marketing environment. To make really cool contacts uh, with people who are very important in the industry. I've met more senior staff here than I've met when I even had real jobs. You don't always get the opportunity to talk to people who are doing what you want to do in the future. Actually being here makes me feel like I'm at the perfect place in my life to be working here. There's so much excitement and enthusiasm in this office and it's contagious. I, I don't want to sound corny, but the whole experience has really been really amazing. It's 
I've learned so much. I would say the highlight is just working here in general. I love the team I work with and I just love the, um, the culture of PBS. I think PBS does a great job at making interns feel very welcome and gives them a lot of information and tools. It's teach me collaboration and to um, make the best out of every situation, even if it's not the ideal situation. And just to be, you know, confident in what you're doing and um, to have fun while you're doing it. Um, it's actually quite funny because uh, this uh, video, it was not planned. <laughs> uh, I, I shot it with my Canon 7D and uh, I, the, backboard, uh, the, the white background is actually a wall. Uh, but what I like to prove with, my, with the stuff that I do, and actually I did it all by myself, from graphics to shooting to editing, everything, is that I don't, I don't believe, I, I think one person could do a lot of things. It just depends how far you want to go, and it's the determination and the passion. Uh, but yeah, uh, and and and, uh, and PBS uh, station services where I work, they're gonna be getting they they're gonna need you know, interns in the spring. So the, my information is there for whoever every student that would like to participate. Okay. Thank you, Julio. That's yeah. wonderful. Um, Julio number two. <laughs> You've quite a you had quite of an eclectic transformation from uh, hospitality and enter entertainment. So why don't you talk sure. about your travels? Sure, absolutely. Well, first and foremost, Kellen, thank you so much for having you know, invited me to join on this panel. And Montgomery College, thank you so much for uh, being so lovely and, and hosting us here. So I'm uh, very happy and honored to be here to join you guys and talk about a subject that I'm very passionate about. And I think I know a little thing of two, of one or thing or two about. So, um, so as Helen mentioned in my bio, I, uh, I've had pretty exciting, a pretty exciting ride. Uh, and also, just as Julio mentioned too, it, it's also very important, I think, as we're talking about the subject matter about how to get into a career in television and or film, uh, or any career for that matter, I think it's about really finding a passion. I think it's very important to really to ask yourself, what is it that you want to do? Um, and more importantly, what are you really good at? And, and I, for one, love to work with people, one, two, and I like to work in fun environments. And I think that, for me, has been kind of the roadmap to my success, sticking along those kind of the safe route that I, that I know I perform best in. I, I'm not good at numbers, so I would never want to be a banker. <laughs> you know, I, I can't stand the side of blood, so I would never be good as a doctor. Uh, but I enjoy working with people, and I, and I found my niche very young. Uh, earlier on, so I was lucky in that sense. So um, just to give you guys a little bit more in depth into what uh, Helen mentioned. So I'm uh, from Santa Monica, California, which is right in LA. It's for those who are familiar with LA, Santa Monica is a beach town. Uh, so I was really lucky to grow up in, uh, but believe it or not, I was probably the only Latino in my high school that never went surfing. So, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever it's worth, I just never got into that sport. But I was lucky enough, and I keep saying the word lucky, and, and I'll get back to what success means, or better, I could just say it now. You know, a lot of us have heard this saying before, but success is really at the intersection of opportunity and, and, and luck. And I've been pretty lucky. And so, and to that, I just want to thank Kellen again, because the Amman Foundation truly ha has changed my life. So thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate what you've done, not just for me and my career, but what you continue to do for the Latino community. Thanks. So, and here we are. So uh, again, going back to my first, my first job on the Santa Monica Pier, I mean, what more can I say? It was you know, a young kid in high school and through college working, you know, every summer on the pier. I mean, can ask for a better job. And I was uh, responsible at the time for hiring people. Um, there was something about, now that I'm thinking about this out loud, you know, being able to get into character, as I call it, get into my job and, uh, and really take it seriously while having good times. I was able to hire some really cool people to join my team and HR, surprisingly, took notice of that. Uh, so I recognized at a very young age I had a, I had a skill you know, to identify good talent, to, to build a team. But being you know, 20, 21 at the time, you don't really know what that really means to the bottom line you know, from a business perspective. As I started to pursue that in college, then I realized, oh wow, I can really, I can really build a career as a businessman 
uh, you know, tap it into my, my strong suit, which is working with people. And so that was the beginning of what became and is now my HR profession, uh, or practice as I call it, because you're constantly learning. With any trade, you, you know, you're only as good as you are currently. You gotta keep getting yourself to the next level, uh, whether by networking, which we'll talk about in a second, you know, honing on your craft, making yourself better the year next, and so forth, so you can keep going up that, that, that ladder. Um, so I started uh, at the pier, for, I was actually with the pier for six years, uh, and then I got into HR there, and before I knew it, I was responsible for hiring all the employees for the amusement park on the, on the pier, which was a big job to take at a, at a relatively young age. So, uh, but I knew I was good at something, and I was reminded that I was good at something because my bosses told me so. And when they started to show me the, you know, I won't bore you with the, the HR jargon, but you know, the turnover rates and so forth, they realized, wow, I'm really contributing to the success of this business. I'm gonna continue to do that. And, uh, but it was one day that uh, a good friend of mine who actually passed away, may you rest in peace, was the one who suggested that I attend uh, this minority job fair that was taking place in Burbank, and you should probably go check it out. I thought, well, you know, I got nothing to lose. I love my job. And that's probably one of the first things I would recommend to you folks here. Best to look for a job when obviously you are employed and are happy at what you do because you don't come across as, you know, at, at that state of desperation to, to, to land that next job. Because if you're currently happy where you're at, hey, if it happens, fantastic. And if it doesn't, eh, well, no harm because I'm still happy where I'm at. And so that was really what happened when I was at the pier and I attended this job fair. But boy, oh boy, was I blown away. I mean, talk about a great job fair. I mean, everybody was there. Warner Brothers, Sony, Disney, MTV Networks, well, Viacom, um, Paramount Pictures, and Televisa, and Telemundo, Univision. I mean, they were all there. And it was wonderful for the first time to walk into a, a, a room and see people like myself um, who were on the other side of that table trying to grab my talent. So I, I recognized then that I thought, well, you know, this, this could be a really cool path for me to take. Um, although I was happy in hospitality, I recognized, wow, who wouldn't want to work in entertainment? It just seems so fun and cool. Uh, and, I, and I recognized, I'm fun and cool. I, I should go after that. <laughs> so, uh, and so I interviewed with Disney. I interviewed with Fox. I interviewed with MTV Networks. And I got the job at MTV Networks. Uh, prior to that interview, I didn't know where their offices were located. Little did I know they were actually in my city down a couple of blocks <laughs> in Santa Monica. So I was really happy that uh, you know, I, was, I was given that opportunity. I, of course, went in as a staffing assistant and also got a chance to work with uh, the senior executive team for the west coast of MTV Networks, which included the EVP and the SVP of Human Resources and, and Facilities and Operations. So at that point, the next level of the career, you start recognizing those role models, those mentors, those people that you actually want to start kind of taking after because you recognize and notice the respect that they gain in the business, um, the way that they conduct their business, and you thought, well, you know what? I recognize that they're really good at what they do, so now I want to be like them. And so five years or less, um, I was there doing you know, good work, but like everyone else in that company, nobody wanted to move out, so that didn't leave me many opportunities to move up. And so there's this uh, saying that we have in our business, and I'm sure it's pretty much everywhere else, but that is sometimes you have to move out to move up. And that's exactly what I had to do. And that came from the words of my mentor. Um, you know, five, four or five years in, I recognized, okay, I can, I can stay here and become a specialist, as we call it, right? I was staffing, so that's what I did. I hired a lot of interns and, you know, got to meet some great talents on the creative side, which is what really drove my interest in this particular business of entertainment, working with the creative folks. Uh, so I recognized, well, I can stick with this, and I know I'm good at this, but I want to be like my boss, and I want to be able to deal with some of the issues that they're dealing with, even though many a times you'd see their eyes roll back and you know, you'd have one employee relations issue after the next. But there was the way, it was the way that they handled it with grace and class that I thought, well, you know what, I want to, I want to go after that. And the only way I was going to be able to do that was to break away from MTV Networks and really take on a new challenge. And, and again, that's, that would be my second uh, point and tip here, which is go after the challenge. If you're not challenging yourself, you're becoming stagnant, and that's not a good place to be when you're trying to grow your career. So I recognized that then again, I had to challenge myself by taking on more responsibilities, tapping into something that I had lost for the last four or five years, which was to interact 
and engage with uh, you know, Spanish-speaking workforce, which in hospitality do a lot of, with the housekeepers and the doormen and the banquet men and so forth. And so here came yet another opportunity where I was lucky to, to land a position as a manager for Hilton Worldwide. And that was huge. I went from working with uh, predominantly Anglo uh, workforce to now being uh, in another environment where I was working with Latinos. And, and it really gave me the opportunity to you know, tap back into my Spanish speaking skill, because I am bilingual, but uh, MD Networks, I didn't have to use it. And so here I was having to you know, interact on, on several levels. And, and I challenged myself. It wasn't always easy, but uh, it was great to learn more about the operation from housekeeping, from banquet halls, to you know, facilities, to uh, you know, everything in between, marketing and so forth. So I was there for about a year. Here's a funny story, and I don't think you remember this one. I attended an Imagen Awards uh, show, and it was uh, the red carpet. It was at the Disney Concert Hall. And Helen was doing the red carpet, and I was standing behind all these photographers. And so I, I get her attention, and she looks at me and goes, hey. I said, I'm at Pelton now. And she just looked and she goes, call me. And she kept walking <laughs> down. And at that point, I recognized, you know what? I, I, I miss this environment. I miss being in, you know, in, in the industry, as we call it. We, right? we call it the industry. So I, I wanted to get back in. And of course, after Helen said, call me, mind you, Helen, I know, had been watching me through my, my upcomings at MTV Networks, where you know, the first year I was at this job fair, the following year, I was back at that job fair, but on the other side of that desk, if you recall. And then year after year, I was there helping Imagen out, representing MTV Networks uh, in recruiting talents, uh, particularly Latino talent, uh, to come join uh, the company. So that was an exciting time. So then when Helen said, call me, and here I was at Hilton thinking, well, I can continue this career in hospitality because you know the perks are great. You get to travel, and you, here's this it was the second, and it's the second largest hotel operation in Los Angeles, um, second to the uh, Bonaventure. So it was, it was a big operation, and there I was, manager on duty many a times, and of course, bring my mother over to come hang out with me, and here we are, laid up in this beautiful suite, and the woman's watching Honovelas, and, and I'm running this like thousand you know, room hotel, and it was an exciting time. But I missed the F-bombs, I missed working with creative people, and I, <laughs> you know, it, it, was, it, was, it was your unconventional way of doing business in entertainment. So that's what took me back. The third tip that I would give you folks here is networking. You know, it's so important to stay relevant to the business that you want to get into, know those players, stay connected and network. And that's exactly what I did in my days back at MTV Networks. I obviously made, made a great connection with Helen and all, you know, in her network of people. And so when I was uh, one day uh, at home thinking, how do I get back into the industry? I thought, well, who can I call and, and how would I start? And, and, I, and I'm already this, at, this far along in my career, I certainly don't want to take a step back. So what would I have to do and who do I need to speak to? And at that time, Nuvo TV, which was called CTV at the time, uh, had an opening for a director of HR. I just so happened to know the director at the time through Imagen, Yvonne Vega, who I, I had sent an email to and said, hey, Amiga, you know, I saw a great show on your network. Um, you know, I just want to give you guys kudos. It looks like you guys are doing some great stuff over there. You know, wink, wink. Um, and she said, listen, by the way, I'm leaving. Would you be interested in coming over and talking about this opportunity? Again, success, intersection, because I was thinking to myself, well, I don't think I'm quite ready for that director level, you know, and reporting to a C CFO and CEO, I thought, oh boy, okay, talk about a leap. But I took the challenge, and I went to that interview, and I wowed them, and I think the only reason why I wowed them was because, I, you know, I was happy at Hilton, again, I had nothing to lose. I had about two cups of espresso before I went to that interview, and I, th I think I was just super excited and full of energy, and I think that really came across as confident, which is, you know, something that you, you must remember when you go into these interviews with, with people. Difference between arrogance and, 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 and confidence. You know, well, we can talk about that in a bit. But uh, you know, went in there knowing what I knew and, and wanted to be a part of that team, having done all that research. So there I was for another five years, and played a key role uh, during CTV's you know growth into changing its brand uh, from CTV to Nouveau TV. Later, you know, building a stronger management team, a new team of creatives to come take the brand from one position to the next. And then lastly, working with the executive team to then appoint Ms. Jennifer Lopez as the chief creative officer for 
uh, Nouveau TV, which was exciting. You know, I was at the table. You know, I was, I think, the second, if not third person who heard from the CEO's mouth that we had just locked that deal with Jennifer Lopez. And I just thought to myself, oh boy, this is big. This is big. And I was so excited and so happy to be able to represent uh, not only Nouveau TV, but, you know, myself and recognizing how far I've come in my career. So that was a, a definite moment to a pause to, to you know, take pride. But like with all things, you gotta keep yourself challenged. You know, I was wondering what's gonna happen next. Networking. I had another friend of mine who I'd made through my networking uh, events through, through the industry. A friend of mine had sent out an email asking for uh, referrals for an HR executive to join Jerry Bruckheimer Films. And I obviously thought, well, how do you mean? I read the description, I thought, yeah, that, that, that fits me. I, I think I'm ready. I think I've done a lot of work, proven work at Nouveau TV. I think I'm ready to take that next leap over. I sent her my resume. Next thing you know, I went through a grueling interviewing process before I got to meet with Mr. Bruckheimer. And when I met with Mr. Bruckheimer, it was uh, another definite point to my career when I thought, whoa, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a meeting and I'm talking about my skill, I'm sorry, I'm talking about my skill set. I'm talking about what I can contribute to this, this wonderful and established world-class brand. And uh, it was a great meeting. And so a couple of weeks later, I was extended an offer. And again, now feeling so fortunate and challenged to take on yet more experience that I had in the past. So, you know, the point, what's brought me to this point uh, in my career personally has been those things that I've stopped to listen to, whether it was the mentors, whether it was the networking that I did, whether it was to gain that confidence to know what I was great at, or maybe good at, and still working at being great at. Because okay. uh, you're never great, you continue to get greater. Uh, but, you know, I figured I, I wanted to stick to something that I knew, I enjoy what I do, I love the, the industry that I work in. So it, all those things line up. Now I'm here talking to you folks about how you folks can get into a, a job into the television or film. And knowing a thing or two about this subject, I can tell you, I look at resumes every day. And, and more so now, you can imagine working for an established production company such as uh, Jerry Bruckheimer Films and television. There's a lot of resumes that I go through. You know, and when you work at that level, you get to really have a, a selection of talent that, uh, for example, Nouveau TV didn't quite have, just because they weren't as known, right? So it took a little bit more elbow grease to try to get candidates through the door and try to get them interested. Uh, all I gotta do with Jerry Bruckheimer Films is say, we have an opening. In fact, I don't even post that we are uh, the company because otherwise I just get inundated with too many resumes. But uh, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity for me to sit there and talk to candidates about their experience, what we look for, what makes the right person a part of our team. And so, again, when we're talking here about how to get a career in television or film, I think I know a thing or two about it. So I look forward to your guys' questions, um, and I hope that I was able to cover a lot um, of what you've asked us to cover. So there you have it. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Monica and I have a lot in common. And one of the things that we have most in common is that we both come from a family of 12. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> traditional Mexican family, um, and have grown um, from uh, our roots, uh, mine and Azusa, uh, Monica's from Santa Barbara. Monica, you've had a very interesting uh, career that started in politics yep. that has led you to your now corporate position, I might add, at the Nielsen Company. So can you kind of talk to us about that? Sure, thank you all, and good, more, or good afternoon. I'm trying to figure out what time zone I'm in. Um, I actually have to commend you all for coming out here on a Saturday, so my hats go off to my head to you for all of you being here at 2 o'clock. Um, unlike Julio, you're the only Latino that doesn't know how to surf. I'm the only Latino that doesn't know how to swim. Um, so, so I'm one of those. But yes, I am the youngest of 12 children. Uh, my parents are from Zacatecas, Mexico, an immigrant family. Um, and being the youngest of 12 kids, you learn how to work as a team, always a team. Some families have um, clothes hand-me-downs. We have job hand-me-downs. So in my family, it was always a family that, you know, if we were connected, we all kind of were in the same industry. The way that my family functioned was that my father was kind of like the CEO, mom was the COO, the kids, we were 
the employees and the nieces and nephews where they're like the contractors, right? So <laughs> we function like that as a family. So what it's done in my entire career is, is actually I've taken that same model to every single job that I've done. And every single job that I've done, my family, like for all of us here, when we graduate, our families come with us, same thing. They come into my jobs and every single one of them that I've done. I uh, graduated from Berkeley. I was a poli-sci major and I minored in Spanish. Um, one of the things that I knew is that it was really important to maintain my Spanish. I knew that the world was changing. It was changing permanently. And let me be very clear. If you don't know a second language, I strongly encourage you. My nieces and nephews, I'm not only telling them to speak Spanish, I'm telling them go learn Chinese, Mandarin. Right. Because you have to be uh, much more global as the world is changing and is changing permanently. Um, I went to Berkeley, and in Berkeley, as you can imagine, it was a world that was very different for me. I was very sheltered growing up with 12 kids, very strict parents. So all of a sudden, I get to a world, and it's liberal, and my mom's freaking out because this is a liberal environment for a very conservative Catholic family as well. Um, in college, I got exposed, and I more or less found myself. I was a very shy kid my entire life, which is kind of ironic because now I do speeches and public speaking for a living. Um, but what happens when you're shy is that you're actually forced to be very observant. So in my career, I've learned to observe environments. I've learned to observe audiences. I've learned to observe my bosses. I've learned to observe really bad mistakes that some executives make and say, ooh, I don't want to be that person. Um, so after graduating from Berkeley, I went and I got my master's at a very different school, USC, in California. So I remember driving into SC and everybody there had, back then it was like the beginning of, um, of car alarms and all these things. Well, I went to SC and I had a club. So I immediately knew I was different. <laughs> um, and this differentness has been something that has gone with me my entire life. At first I was very uncomfortable with it, but now I realized as I started moving up in my career that my differentness is my biggest asset. After graduating from SC, I was lucky enough to be, because I was commuting back and forth from Santa Barbara, my father had just had a stroke and um, he became disabled. So I was driving two hours uh, to get to SC from Santa Barbara because I wanted to spend the time with him as he was uh, disabled and he lasted disabled for 15 years. And I became very good friends and as a good organizer, one of the things I learned is the ability to organize. So I made sure that I had my classes Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I happened to find one guy in the class that had the exact same classes as me. So what did I do? You go to class Thursdays, I go to class Tuesdays, and we swap notes. <laughs> I also became that student that because I was pressed for time, I would be getting ready to do a speech or a presentation of some, so I would get there early as the students come in and said, okay, all of you, don't ask me any questions. So all of a sudden, I would plant my questions in the audience. So I looked really good in front of my teachers, right? But it was this ability to organize and to make sure that at the end of the day, I was getting what I needed out of my classes and that I was going to be the person that stood out looking okay and going to get by. So now as I've seen all of this happen, I've realized that I've started to use all these skill sets in my entire career. I also, having come from such a large family, um, we had restaurants. My brother was a gardener his entire life, and one day he decided he didn't want to be a gardener anymore, so he opened up a restaurant. Well, when you have that much family, we all worked the restaurants. And I could have stayed in Santa Barbara and had a very successful career running restaurants, but I was leaving where my tennis shoes were smelling like carnitas every day. And I realized, I don't want this. So I needed to move on to something different. But the best training I ever got was working at that restaurant. You absolutely, for those of you who know about restaurants, it is the hardest job you're ever going to have to do. You become a finance expert, you become a customer service expert, you become security, you become police, you become a cook, and you figure out how to organize. Imagine having 100 people in line and they're asking you for orders of 30 to 40 tacos, and you gotta figure out how to move that line at lunch. So you become very strategic. I'll say, okay, boom, you're the cook, you cook these, but you can't stop the orders from moving, right? If you have someone making an order of 100 tacos, you still need to get those orders of two out of the way. So a lot of it for me was how do you strategically build an assembly line that is going to move the ball and keep you moving and keep your business strong. Um, so I say that the restaurant business was probably the best experience I've ever had. It forced me also to be nice to people. And the ability to be nice and charming 
but also forceful and get them out of the way. Trust me, you get frustrated when you have these lines. So I became very good at perceptions and how do you make people feel good about you. So why do I say this example? Because one of the things I realized is as I've now been moving up and doing a lot more of the public speaking, is that what you really have to do is think about three things. What do you want people to hear when you're speaking? What do you want them to feel? And what do you want them to do? What is the plan of action, right? So for me, it's that the biggest piece of it is what do you want them to feel when they experience something with you? And again, this is something that as I've moved on from career to career, from job to job, I've realized that if I can make people feel good about me, about what I'm saying, you're always going to have to be smart. No doubt about it. You're, you have to be intelligent and you have to be good at your craft. But what people remember more is how you make them feel. So in my entire life, and Ida's gonna talk about that because she makes us all feel great all the time, but that to me has been the key to what has been in a successful career. So when I went into, uh, when I got out at SC, the same person that we switched courses, he found um, a, a candidate, a, a politics, a political candidate, that back then was a very kind of unknown name, a guy named Via Ragosa. Nobody knew who he was. They said, who is this guy? I couldn't even pronounce his name. So he had interviewed with him, and he said, um, back then he was Speaker of the California State Assembly. He had said, hey, I met this man. He's looking for somebody exactly kind of with the same type of experience. I know you're going to be looking for a job. Do you know what you want to do? He said, no, I have no idea. He's like, give me your resume. I gave him my resume. About a week later, I get a call for an interview. Uh, turns out that we both have the exact same credentials, so this man is trying to decide who to hire, him or me, and I speak Spanish. <laughs> so uh, we have the same credentials. Lucky enough, he hired both of us, and that truly was the turning point. And for those of you who may not know who I'm speaking about, this was uh, the Los Angeles Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Um, I was his at then field rep at the time, so it's really how to use service. He's the first Latino mayor in Los Angeles in over 100 years, so I've been part of his trajectory and part of his history uh, during his uh, campaigns and was part of his mayoral victory um, in 2005. Um, so one of the things that I realized in this field of politics is I was very, again, kind of that shy person. I always wanted to be behind the scenes. But one thing as I always did is uh, I was always on time. I was always the first person in the office. So sometimes when you're on time, it works. I ended up being the first person in the office one day when all of a sudden he called. Nobody else was there, so I answered. He wasn't looking for me. He was looking for uh, someone else who was a lot more gregarious and, and vocal, and her name was Susan. I said, no, Susan's not here right now. Um, only I'm in the office. He, and he said, well, who's there? I said, only me. He said, okay, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to get me uh, on every radio station that you possibly can to talk about this bill. It was the Healthy Families Bill, a health insurance bill. Um, he said, do you think you can do that? I'm like thinking, sure, <laughs> let me try. So I ended up getting him on every local radio station in Los Angeles and on even television. And he said, how did you do that? I have no idea how I did it. I just did it because he asked me to do it. So all of a sudden he said, you got something. So I was moved into the media department, again, unexpectedly, unknowing. And all of a sudden I'm dealing with press, with media, understanding how to cut through the clutter of newsrooms when they're getting all the information. And I had to figure out then what this whole media landscape was. I had to learn how to write talking points. I know how to speak in bullets and um, how to speak in sound bites, which is so critical for all of you as you're getting in front of your, 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 your jobs and you're talking to people. Know your sound bites, know what they are and be prepared for those. So that experience catapulted me to a job um, as press secretary in a couple years. He moved me up to be press secretary and when you're in politics, that's kind of the job you want to have, uh, being a press secretary, because what it does is it keeps you very much in tune with strategy. It keeps you in tune, connected to the candidate, which in politics is all about how close you can be to the candidate. Um, and it allowed for me to truly understand a media entertainment landscape that I never even knew existed. Um, so this world that I was now in forced me, again, to use my knowledge of building relationships. I was the only person in press conferences that could get every single camera to take footage of my candidate. Why? Because I knew how to build those relationships. That was 11 brothers and sisters of mine that we taught how to negotiate and figure out. I had it to the point where they were running, and I would say, just put the camera on, don't turn on the lights, just make them think that you're filming them. 
and they would do this for me because at the same time they were trying to help me and it was just that relationship with them that I knew they wanted to help me and that if they needed an interview with my candidate, I was always gonna find a way to get them five minutes. Um, after that first stint, we then ran for mayor, we lost the first race. Uh, horrible feeling to lose a race, but it teaches you, it teaches you about loss. And everybody thought he was gonna win, you're behind a campaign, you're behind. And we lost, the minute that we lost, I had three job offers the same day. Why? Because people started to understand, you know who's this woman, she's building a brand for herself, she's, big, she's a good worker. And you know what, I wasn't very public, it was just they saw me hustle, and they saw me move. So what I realized is people are watching you at all times, even when you don't even realize it. So I had job offers, I ended up turning down three, and I ended up taking a job at Telemundo, where when I was at Telemundo, what I did then is I ran public and community affairs, sued the city of Los Angeles, uh, uh, because they did not give us equal representation as they were giving the other station. Um, nobody thought that any network could do that. I was happy to do that. Then I went to an ad agency. After the ad agency, eh, I found out what I really hated doing was ad agency, ad work. <laughs> Uh, so I left, and I didn't like the people I worked for, and I said, you know what, I don't want to work for people I don't want to work for. Um, I ended up not having a job. The mayor decided to run again for mayor, and he won this time. And on that campaign, what I did is I worked with some of the best opposition researchers that ever exist. These are people who are finding all the bad stuff about you, and we all have it. So we were able to find out, I learned the process of research. The other thing I realized is how men work together. They can all cuss each other out. Five minutes later, it's like, hey, you want to go to lunch? I'm thinking, wow, how, we wouldn't do that as women. But, <laughs> but they, I learned this process of fighting hard. I also learned uh, the process of judgment, when to go in for my candidate, when to tell him the bad news, when do I tell him the good news. Um, and after this, uh, I had been doing this, this, we won the race, <clears throat> but you know what, I really didn't want to work in city government. Um, city government, to me, was, was just not something I, I felt like I wanted to do. Nielsen, you know, talk about relationships. This is when, again, one of those situations where um, Helen, who knew me at the time and had been seeing me kind of through my trajectory, said, hey, you gotta, you know, there's this company, you wanna, Nielsen, you wanna uh, send me your resume? Sure, I didn't have a job that I really wanted. I sent it to her, and uh, here I am at Nielsen. I've been here for 10 years. So what does this mean? It means that all of you need to know Helen, for one. <laughs> yes. uh, and, and second is that, that I've never had to apply to a job in my life. It's always been because people have been watching. People have been watching you. So if you become good and an expert in your craft, people are going to be watching you. And I think that this is really important. So just, I know that we're pressed for time, so I just want to tell you and we can open it up for conversations. The, the thing about Nielsen is this. For all of you that are trying to get into the entertainment industry, you cannot not know about Nielsen. For those of you who are maybe wondering, we are known for being the television ratings company. And why is it so important? Because every television and entertainment company, it's about revenue and ratings. It's about that box office day. And if you understand the business of revenue and ratings, you are going to be much better and much more marketable when you try to figure out what is the job and the business that you want to do. Um, I've been at Nielsen, I've been moved three times into three different roles, and every single role has made me uncomfortable. I've learned to be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. And I've learned the idea of having to stretch yourself. And whenever I kind of am feeling stretched, I feel like backing out sometimes, but that's what's forced me to be uh, better at what I do. And the other thing is it, does, is it forces you to evolve through the changes, right? If you look at the media landscape, whether it's television, whether it's online, whether it's mobile phone, whether it's Hulu, we have to be in front of all of those technological changes and we have to be able to know how to measure that. So for me, it's forced me to diversify my experience, my zone, to be understand how technology changes and it moves. And you have to be agile. You have to be able to move in and out of it. And the one thing I say about working in, in, in Nielsen is that Every single client, you know, most of you know us as a TV ratings company, we can measure every 2.7 seconds of what you watch on TV. Um, and people pay a lot of money for that. So for us, we have to be accurate, we have to be precise, and again, you have to be delivering constantly and being ahead of what the consumer is. Ada, you more or less represent our talent here. Oh. And the journey of someone who is talented 
uh, and trying to break down those doors in the entertainment industry, especially as a single mom. So why don't you tell us about your journey? Okay. Well, um, first of all, give it up for everyone that, that there is so much talent up here. So give it up for them. <laughs> yes. I'm going to ask uh, those of you that are trying to take naps to wake up because it affects my self-esteem when you go to sleep while I'm talking. <laughs> and you don't want to be on camera asleep. Um, it's not going to look good. But um, how are you? How is everybody doing today? Good. Happy to be here. I'm glad you're here. It says um, a lot about what you're trying to do. Um, and the reason why I say that people that show up are the ones that win. And, um, and I will tell you that um, I'm a stand-up comedian, and that is one of the hardest jobs for a woman to do um, because it is an all-boys club. And um, I had to go up my first two years of comedy at least six nights a week just to get the opportunities that guys that would go up twice a week would get. So I've always worked. Um, anybody here watches uh, Scandal? Does anybody watch? So you heard the dad was like, you got to work twice as hard to be blah, blah, blah. That speech that I had to give it to myself every day because stand up comedy is a, is a Hollywood is a, an exclusion town. It is a, a, a business that is set up not to let you in. It is a, a survivor's um, retreat, if you will, is what a career in Hollywood is. It is those people that decided that they wanted it more, that they were going to go the extra mile, that they were not going to be a victim, and that they were going to make a decision to own a, a piece of that place that makes everybody else happy when things are going bad. I mean, movies was an es escape for people during times of war and, people, and the depression for people to go. So that's what entertainers do. Um, unfortunately, many of us forget that it's called show business, and we get so caught up with the show that we forget about the business, which is why I like to listen to people like this that are talking about the things that affect the opportunities that create a place for me to make a living. Um, because if I could just tell jokes every day, all day long, everywhere, and not get paid, we would starve and my kids would beat me. <laughs> so um, this has to be a job where um, I'm making money, and I'm creating an opportunity for myself and that the opportunity that I create for myself later creates opportunities for others. Because it, it, if you're not doing this to create opportunities, then um, I think you're wasting your time because no man is an island in Hollywood. You're not gonna make it by yourself. A lot of people really think, oh, I wanna do it, I don't need anyone's help. That's a damn lie. In Hollywood, you are gonna, and anywhere that, that affects, affects other people, you're gonna have to work with other people and you're gonna have to learn to play well with others. You're gonna have to suck it up and sometimes you're gonna have to work with a Democrat if you're a Republican. And sometimes you're gonna have to work with a white person if, even if you've never seen a white person from the town that you come from. Sometimes you're gonna have to work with a gay person even if you were taught that gay people are going to hell. And, 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 and you're gonna have to adopt a system of beliefs that allows you to accept others and so I come from Miami, Florida. We talked about it earlier. Not so, such a great place for me where I grew up with the mentality that I have. Um, a little brown girl uh, with parents that uh, come from Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic, and my stepfather is Cuban, so I single-handedly represent the entire Spanish-speaking <laughs> Caribbean. <laughs> so tell you about how I grew up. Um, and I grew up um, in, in the middle of the inner city, uh, surrounded by people who accepted no as their way of life. Uh, you can't do this. You're never going to do that. You, it's hard to do that. Our people don't do this. We can't do this. And I... I adopted metaphysics at a very young age. I knew that there was something in my programming that was different than the people around me because I would never accept no for an answer. And, um, and I remember looking at television and the only person I remember that looked like me on TV was Rita Moreno. You guys know who Rita Moreno is? And that was like weird because I was like, where are, where are my people? Like why is she the only person that I can that I can relate to, not just because of being Latin, but being brown and not being the typical Latina. If I would watch novelas, everybody would, some of them would have blonde hair and blue eyes, speaking Spanish, no one looked like me. Um, when I looked at, in the world of comedy, it was Bob Hope, Johnny Carson, nobody looked like me anywhere. And I was like, what is going on? How am I going to change this? 
So um, I, I started modeling at a very young age. I was recruited uh, when I was 14. I'm very tall, and as Monica would say, wow, you're tall for a Puerto Rican. <laughs> so did other people. Like They were like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. I haven't met someone that's brown, that tall, speaks Spanish, um, and knows English. Um, and so I started modeling, and I was always the funny person on modeling. I didn't fit in very well. I was always hungry. <laughs> to start there and it was really really frustrating to be hungry all the time and then you'd see the models with the attitudes and stuff in there they were hungry that's why they looked <laughs> they were really hungry and I just I, I didn't fit in you know and uh, that's why Naomi Campbell's always throwing blackberries at people nobody now you know um so I I and I wanted to be a stand-up comedian when I was little Johnny Carson was my hero I used to walk around saying, I did not know that, because I, I thought he was the funniest man, so much that I would tell people he was my father. <laughs> like, that was like, that's my dad. I don't like the one at my house. I'm keeping that one. <laughs> so um, I, I, my, my family being the traditional Latin family that they are, they didn't accept comedy as a journey for their young daughter. They thought, they always say that comedy is for men. That is not something that you're gonna suffer too much if you do that. They're not gonna let you in. And so I, I started modeling. I don't know why they thought that was a better idea, but um, I didn't fit in. And I was the comedian behind, I mean, I would do all kinds of things. I would have everyone laughing all the time. You know, I was always getting in trouble. I, I taped Snickers to the inside of my legs so that I could eat during the runway shows. I was hungry. And, um, and I just got tired. I developed an eating disorder. Um, I became anorexic and I almost died. I was 117 pounds, I'm 5'11" and they still wanted me to lose more weight. And I just made a decision, an executive decision over my own life that that wasn't what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to make people laugh. I wanted to be an actress. I wrote my first script when I was like eight. My first script was my wedding to Michael Jackson. Hello. <laughs> I, had, I had already, I had scripted it out. I didn't know he was going to change and become a girl too. But... Um, <laughs> I, I thought that we were going to get married. So I wrote the whole script because I, I needed my mother to behave at my wedding. And so I had to write the script because I needed her to follow that to the letter. And, um, and I just knew that I always wanted to be an entertainer. I've always, I never wanted to do anything else. I, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I never wanted to be a doctor. I knew that I always wanted to be an entertainer, make people happy, make people feel good, and, um, and use my, my intelligence as a way to stimulate others to find their own greatness. And that's always been what, what moves me. And when people ask me, why do I do what I want to do, is because I like to make other people feel good, and I like to move other people. And um, I don't want to just tell jokes. I want to tell jokes with a purpose. I want to talk about things that are uncomfortable that we all need to, to face. I want to focus on things that are you know, a bigger deal to us um, as opposed to just being a jester or a clown and just tap dance for jokes. So I set out on a journey. I will tell you that no matter what you want to do with your life, it is, and I, I'm an advocate for literacy, and I will tell you that there is nothing that you will do that, you will, that does not require a great amount of reading. Whether you want to be an actress, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be a doctor, you must read. Reading is fundamental. It is the greatest gift that you can give to yourself. It doesn't matter how old you are, if you've never been a reader. If you're 80 and you start reading, your life will be better for it. Um, people that read out loud 10 minutes a day tend not to develop Alzheimer's. And I know that because I read it. And I, and I think it's just very important to read. Actors, people think that we're just shells. Um, Angela Bassett went to Yale. Denzel Washington is probably one of the most intelligent, well-read men in the business. Uh, Sandra, Bullock, Sandra Bullock reads all the time. Reading, it, the better of a reader you are, the better of an actor you will be, the better of a performer you will be, the more informed you will be on your craft, anything in your craft, anything that you want to do. It is so important. I really push for reading. I give away bookmarks at my shows because I really think it's so important to be a reader. Um, a comedians cannot be great comedians if they don't read. You have to know the, what's going on in your world, in your environment. You cannot talk about stuff that you don't know anything about. And if you're going to talk about the government and if you're going to make jokes about politics, then you better be informed on what you're talking about because people will hold you accountable for that. 
Um, so uh, I, I, I'm very wordy. I do this a lot, so I, I want to keep it brief. But I, I do want to emphasize a couple of things because I think it's very important, specifically for the younger minds. Focus is so important. As creatives, we have creative ADD. We want to do, I want to write a play, I want to be in a movie, I want to write a song, I want to design a dress. This is my daily process every morning after I eat my breakfast. Oh, I, want, I think I want to design this. I, somebody was talking about how John Leguizamo designed his own artwork for today. That is where artists, uh, we, we live in an artistic realm where we want to express ourselves daily through our art. But I will tell you that focus is something that is so far gone now because all you see is people who tell you how they do everything. I'm a designer, I'm a singer, I'm a rapper, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a that. And, and I think that is so dangerous because not being good at anything and trying to do everything will make you, lead you down a road of despair. And then your self-esteem drops because you think you're not good at things because you have not learned work ethic and don't understand that focusing in on one thing, Diddy has 10 million things. What made him successful was that he was a marketing genius. And what he did was market, 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 market till he became, did, uh, he was puffy at the time. And that opened the opportunities for him to become a designer, become, a, he's a mogul now. But what made him successful was that one thing that he did. Jennifer Lopez perfected dancing. Dancing made her a fly girl. That caught people's attention, which opened the doors for acting. But she danced for many years before any of us knew who she was. And being a great dancer is what created opportunities for her. The reason why I speak on this is because I think that now, because of YouTube, the internet, everybody is everything. People are comedians online on Vine for six seconds. Let me tell you something. I tell jokes for 45 minutes to an hour. Nobody who tells jokes for six seconds will stand on a stage and survive for an hour in front of people who have been drinking and working all week. <laughs> they will die a slow death. I promise you. It took me six years to develop one year of comedy because I love what I do and I respect it enough to give it the work and the respect and the responsibility and accountability that it deserves for me to be good at it. And so I invite you, you know, to... Make a decision about what you want to do with your life. I don't care if you're a parent, if you're here just visiting, if you're on the staff and the crew. The universe agrees with a made-up mind. When you make a decision about what you want to do and you take a step towards it, it will take 10 towards you. And, and if you want to be an actor, learn how to write a play. Learn how to, to, how to, how, learn how to produce a play. Learn how important sound is in the play. Because I will tell you, from looking at everybody in here, you're not the Hollywood type. Because nobody is. The Hollywood types are the top people, the A-list actors, Jennifer Lawrence. That's a Hollywood type right now. I'm not. So I will create my own opportunities. I will write my own plays. I will find the funding for them put them up on a, at a theater, invite everyone that I know. I will market my own plays. I will know every part of my play from the sound to the lights to the script because that is my job as an artist is to know everything that goes on. And, what, and one thing I will also invite you to adopt is that never underestimate where somebody is going to land. Always treat everybody with respect. These people all have told you their journeys and you saw where they all began. And someone could have easily been like, oh, he's just a, a job fair kid or she's just, you know, answering the phone early at a, a mayor's office. And you will eventually circle back around to these people and have to sit down in front of her one day and say, hi, I'm sorry I said that 10 years ago, but <laughs> I really changed and now I'm a better person. You don't forget. And we don't forget, because we don't forget people that treat us poorly because, you know, we are affected by that. And just remember, you, your vessel is affecting other people, even if you're at McDonald's. I, I was at the DMV, and I let a man go in front of me. And my cousin, who's really feisty, was like, we've been here forever. How are you just going to let him? I was like, he looks like he's in a really big hurry. And I said, just let him go. Two weeks later, I was in a room auditioning for that man, and I didn't know who that man was until I went in and auditioned for him. 
And if I would have been that B at the DMV, <laughs> I would not have had my rent paid in April of 2007 because I booked that job. <laughs> and I think that I'm a good actress, but I think I'm a really good person at the DMV. <laughs> So um, I, I will just tell you that I just I invite you guys to embrace, especially how many artists in the room? Where are the artists? Any artists in the room? Okay, so it's important to embrace your humanity. And I know it sounds corny and it sounds, when you, even if you, when you're in a, on a crew, you're going to work with somebody for an extended amount of time and everybody standing around you is a person. Leave your judgment at home. I know it's cool to judge people because they, they, they kind of push it, like like buttons on Facebook, YouTube. We've become a, a society of judgment, and we all have an idea, and we all want to express it, and we're always talking about other people. But focus on yourself, what it is that you want to do with your life, and really, really work towards your goals. Be very goal-driven. Um, I have my three-month... Three, a three-month, six-month mark, my nine-month mark, my year mark, my five-year mark, my 10-year mark. I work from that. I, most of my friends that are artists don't. They think that one day they're going to walk into a Starbucks. His boss is going to walk in and say, oh, my God, there he is. <laughs> he is the next Tom Cruise. That doesn't happen. Uh, what happens is that people work every day really hard to become good at what they do. Uh, they don't sleep as much as most. They work twice as hard, run faster, eat less, and go, 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 just to get an opportunity to get in the door. And once you get in the door, then you start working. So don't think that because you are the best person in your class, or you're, you're funnier than someone, or you're smarter than someone, that, that, that is enough. You are a collective of talents drive, motivation, and spirit that takes you where you need to go. And you, can, you can't sleep. And I, I mean that figuratively, but I don't sleep. Literally, I sleep four hours a day uh, because I'm writing material for myself. I have to write material for others that I sell to. I write screenplays. I write, um, I write I'm a blogger. I'm an examiner. Um, so I am constantly writing because as a comedian, that is my job. And nobody has to pay me for it, for me to do it, because it is my job. And if I want to be great at what I, want, what I want to do, I have to do what Chris Rock is doing, but not getting paid as much as Chris Rock. You understand what I'm saying? And that's what it is with whatever you're doing. Look at the people who are doing what you want to do at a great level and observe all of the things that they're doing. That's what you need to be doing, whether you're getting the amount of money that they're not. Entitlement doesn't have a place in Hollywood. There's no, there's no place for it, for it because those people who, who are there at the top now that are entitled, they eventually have to come down. And if you watch the, the circus that is Hollywood, it's like high school. Once you're not cool anymore, everybody turns on you. you it happens to everybody. It doesn't matter. You are watching it happen to Mr. Cosby as we speak. It happens to everyone. Everyone is humbled at some point. No one stays the star till they're 100 and then they die. It's just, that's just not the way it is. So I just, I invite you to, to embrace your humanity. Make a decision about what you want to do. Focus on it. Research it. Learn about it. Really read about it and listen. Because if you're not a good listener, you're not going to make it. If you're not a good listener as an actor, you're not going to make it. You have to be able to listen to other people. And don't treat, treat people bad. That's it. <laughs> I think we've heard several themes here, and, and one, uh, I think one is, of course, to focus, and the other is to know what you're good at. Um, I mentioned very briefly early on that I was a former union organizer, and I happened to meet Norman Lear, and, and I guess my focus had always been about trying to change the world and make a difference and provide opportunities for other people, and that's what my life basically has been about. And, um, and I think one of the interesting things about Ada and I, especially, is that we're both moms. Yes. And, um, but I know, don't like my kids. <laughs> she likes hers. I like hers, too. I just don't like mine. <laughs> um, and I think it's important to know that, you know, when you're, when you're a working mom, if you will, um, that it's important to um, know that 
Um, the inclusion of your kids and your kids knowing what you're doing is really important. And the value of the work that you do, whether you're a stand-up comic or whether you're um, working for a television production company that is really high profile. And, um, and I think I owe a lot to my children because they taught me a lot too. Um, and, um, and honestly, sometimes I think, how do they put up with their mother because of some of the crazy things that, that, I, that I've done over the course of my, of my life. Um, but I've been blessed in so many ways in that, you know, working for Norman Lear, um, I've been to the Middle East on a diplomatic tour. Um, I've worked for a man who changed the face of television. Um, I've been on major boards um, uh, in, in the country. I've um, uh, been on the board of the Fund for the Feminist Majority. I've been um, national, um, uh, for now, the National Organization for Women, National Council of Raza, MALDEF, all those things opened opportunities and doors for me. The point now where I'm now on the National PBS board, which again comes through working with people and networking and, and showing, um, uh, showing people the capabilities that you have in terms of inclusion, because for me it's always been about inclusion. Um, and, you know, I mentioned my, my children, and I have my son actually in the audience, so I have to just uh, um, recognize him. <laughs> um, and he actually lives here in the District of Columbia. Uh, so uh, uh, I was really proud that Rick, Rick, stand up. <laughs> it's my son. <laughs> Product of, of, of a mother that had some uh, wild ideas and dreams that actually came through. through. So... Um, Anyway, um, so with that, I just want to kind of open it up. I know we were going to, I was going to post some questions, but I think what I'd like to do is open it up for questions from the audience um, and see, we'd like to hear from you. Um, you know, entertainment is really one of those uh, industries that are kind of um, uh, uh, different and people don't know a lot about it. So I believe we have two mics. So does anyone have a question? You want to come to the mics, please? That way, so that we can... Are you going to... Okay, there you go. I got one. Hi there. My name is Melina Butler, and I resonate with a lot of you because you're from California, some of you from Santa Monica, et cetera. Um, and it took me to moving to Washington, D.C. to become interested in um, the what you might call the industry. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question, actually, um, that is kind of um, piggyback on something you said about... Um, Confidence and arrogance. I was just wondering if you might speak on that because it is an industry that seems to be filled with those type of um, words. So if you could speak on that. Sure, sure. So you know, from, a, from an HR perspective, we're constantly meeting, and I refer to it as talent, but really it's the candidates, right? And, and so there's two ways to look at it. You know, from a candidate's perspective, you, you want that job so badly, right? Or you want to get that gig so badly. And so sometimes you overcompensate by now not being confident in your craft, but rather trying to oversay yourself by perhaps thinking you're better than others when quite frankly you're not. And, and it's a humbling experience when you go through a grueling interviewing process, especially when you're trying to get into the bigger net, networks or studios. You know, you're one of many, right? And, there, and talents like uh, graphic designers or, you know, you can name any, any particular position or job uh, in the industry. Um, there is a dime a dozen, you know, there's multiple designers or uh, I, you, I can't even think of one particular job right now because there's so many that run through my head. But the point there is, you know, I come across so many candidates when we sit down and we talk about not so much the position but rather their, their ability to contribute to the success of the company. And all of a sudden it becomes not so much about how they can contribute, it becomes about me, 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 me. And it's like, okay, well, we're not hiring because it's just about you. It's about how you can join our team, right? And so that's why I say that from, a candidate, from, a, from dealing with a candidate, I think it's very important to, to recognize what you're really great at and talk to those strengths in a way that's humbling and, and quite convincing, but not so turn off by, you know, you just talking so much that quite frankly, no one's really gonna believe you, right? Because it's, it's really, uh, you know, you've got to be a product of your work. And so the work itself will talk for yourself. And, and, I, and I also want to just point something out real quickly because we both address the issue of branding, you know. And, and, I, and I wanted to make that a point. And sorry, I wasn't texting earlier. I was trying to refer to my notes here. Because I did want to make sure that 
as people trying to get into the industry, and even those that are already in this industry, it's very important to know who you are. Because this industry will constantly test you, whether you're in front of the camera or even behind the camera. You know? And so to recognize who you are, what you're great at, and be, be honest with yourself. You know? if, if, if you're not good at acting or you don't like reading, then maybe you shouldn't go you know, <laughs> after that job. But if you are good at something, then you need to start branding yourself now. What do you want people to recognize and pick up on when they hear your name, right? That's very important. You know, I carry the weights of not just the company I represent, but who I want to come across as. So that's very important, and that comes across in confidence. Not coming in here thinking that I'm better than anybody else. I'm just good at what I've done, and quite frankly, I've been lucky to, to get the, re the success that I've gained. But, but none of that would have been possible without the opportunity that was presented, but quite frankly, the hard work that I put in, right? Because there's no substitute for hard work, no matter what industry you go into. But certainly in our industry, it's very highly competitive. So you need to quickly adjust and know what you're good at, who you are, and then the rest will take, take play. Um, I'd like to also address that simply from the, the point of view of an actor and a, an entertainer. Because um, you, you said that the business is filled with arrogance. Well, we live in a, in a the, our industry is, it, one of the mantras is you got to fake it till you make it. Um, you have to, um, I, I think confidence is what you know about yourself and arrogance is what you'd like to believe. Um, and, and some people are selling, you know, a bill of goods that they can't back up with substance. But you, I think a lot of times Hollywood is condemned for being Hollywood. And I'm really big on defending that because Hollywood is a land of make-believe filled with illusion, filled with people that are there to sell you illusion. And then you condemn them for that. Not you, but people do. And I just think it's so unfair because they're always like, oh, he's so Hollywood, she's so Hollywood. Yeah, we are. I mean, we are entertainers, we are make-believe. We're not your children's role models. We're not the teachers of tomorrow. We don't go out teaching your kids the Pythagorean theorem quadratic formula. We're not there to teach you what religion or what your belief should be. We're just entertainers. And I think that the media is driving us into a place that can be a little bit scary right now. And I have to stand up for my people, my fellow artists, because a lot of responsibility is placed on us sometimes that you, I, I don't agree with everything that Kim Kardashian does, but Kim Kardashian is not the role model in my household for my daughter. I am. And I just think it's very important to keep into perspective that our entertainers are, are just that. They're entertainers. And they're there to sell lipstick and movies and illusions. They're, they're, we, we've placed so, put them on a pedestal and, and the expectation of what a, a, an entertainer is supposed to meet sometimes, just a little bit, a little bit um, hard. So we're, we're there to be fake. And, um, and a lot of us can be real within that fakeness. Some of us, unfortunately, can't. But it, it, it is the land of make-believe. And so I just, I just want to, you know, just to speak up on behalf of my fellow entertainers because that, that's the job, you know? And, um, and I think we, we are, we are be, sometimes we, they beat us up a little bit too much for that. I also wanted to mention that um, uh, if you're shy and introverted, um, the entertainment industry isn't for you, because... <laughs> <Volumes pick you up. laughs> Thank you. Um, it, you know, one of the things I had to learn coming from a, a Mexican family where I was taught to be respectful uh, and humble was stop being humble. You really need to step into a position of being able to feel good about who you are and confident about who you are. Um, and... Um, Thinking that someone's going to recognize your capabilities sometimes doesn't work. You almost very subtly have to remind people what your skill sets are. Uh, you don't have to, you know, as, a, as, a, as a woman of color, you have to be careful in how you do it. But there are ways of being able to let people know um, what you have to offer, especially in, in a corporate position. So I think that, you know, if, if, if you think you want a career and you can't be articulate, you can't, you're afraid of talking to people or if someone with a big title, you know, scares you, this isn't the business for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yes, I have a question. Um, my daughter is going to be uh, graduating in a couple weeks in marketing with a film minor, and she was a film studies. Uh, she got that because she saw, you know, films like Frozen or whatever, that there's so much marketing besides the actual film or whatever, and that's what got her excited about that. Uh, being that she's going to graduate soon, uh, like Monica, I was think what kind of skill set she w would need or whatever. Uh, she was in, uh, did an internship with the LA Film Festival last summer, um, and she had some other small things uh, prior to that. Or I guess another, uh, Julio, uh, what kind of um, job path do you recommend for somebody just starting off? Um, digital, digital, digital. It's all digital right now. So I think that one of the things that I'm finding is the, the, the speed of technology is really how do you make all the digital components fit into your marketing plans now. So I think it's understanding uh, the speed of mobile phones, understanding the speed of social networks and uh, social media, understanding how, you mentioned Kim Kardashian for example, whether you love her or hate her, one of the things that she's done very well is she's created a brand. So she'll do focus groups on her own websites and all of a sudden it provides immediate mm -hmm. uh, results. And she did a focus group, for example, where she said, do you want my perfume to be this pink, this pink, or this pink? So it means knowing how to interact with your consumer through social media to build and push your brand forward. Um, the other skill set that I, that, that I want to say is really important in marketing is you know, I, I have to tell a story. You have to be a real good at your craft in terms of telling a story. I work for a very complex business, media or measurement. I have to make that simplify it into terms that people understand. So it's the, the art of being a good storyteller and being able to simplify your message. So again, that it cuts through the clutter where there's so much going on that you have to figure out how to get your brand in front. Um, and the other thing, which is totally not something you would think of, is you have to understand finance and business. How does it work? What are marketing plans put together? Is it a $10 million campaign? Is it a campaign that's good, that you can, is through earned media? So really, how do you maximize uh, your dollars through the avenues, the channels that you have? It's a very, very different space. Twitter, uh, all of the social networks right now are huge to, to marketing plans. Now I'll jump to this. One of my favorite words is maximize. <laughs> you got to maximize your skill set. And, and for someone starting off uh, fresh out of college, for example, and knowing that this is the path that you say your daughter um, has chosen, which is marketing, the minor uh, in film, if you recognize earlier on, and this is something that I just had a conversation with the candidate about uh, this past week, which is when you start to quickly, not quickly, because it happens over time, and then I think in, in, this, in today's age, you know, us Americans, we're constantly changing careers, right? But someone who's starting off, and, and, and the, the best thing you can do to yourself uh, in, in having longevity in your career is to do something you enjoy doing. Because there's no point in looking back at your life 10, 20 years later recognizing, no, I hate banking. <laughs> and, and now I want to get into development. I want to get into production. Well, guess what? So does everyone else that's in Hollywood and those that are trying to come in from out of Hollywood. So now you're gonna start over and, and life happens. And I, and I tell this to people because what I mean by life happens is you know, you eventually uh, get married, you buy a home, you have a car note, you have children. And so before you know it, it's not as easy to take that you know, nice salary that you have as a banker, for example, to now saying, you know, I'm having that itch to really explore my creative side uh, in Hollywood. Well, guess what? If you're going to take that, that leap into to Hollywood, well, then be ready to deal with the consequences and the reality, which is you're going to have to start somewhere, and that somewhere's going to be at the bottom and work your way up, just like anywhere else. So I would say to, to your daughter in this case, if, if truly that's what she wants to do, which is marketing, get in it now. Start now. Build that career earlier on because you can then say five, ten years down the line, wow, look at my path. I've carved it. I've created a brand for myself. But in that trajectory, I've stayed the course, which is marketing, which is marketing in film, right? So more, more, more particular in that end. You want to start fine crafting your, 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 your profession, your craft, as we would call it, and start, start as soon as you can. Um, can I and I would, if I, if I could just also, um, um, she may not get the job she wants. 
And with the degree, you know, some kids come into Hollywood thinking, oh, I went to, to NYU or I went to Columbia or I went to the Annenberg School at USC and I'm going to get out and I'm going to be making 100000 a year working in the entertainment industry. Well, that doesn't happen. Julio's point about starting at the bottom, there are people out there that have two degrees still trying to get in. For every one job in the entertainment industry, there are 100 or more people on the street trying to get that one job. So sometimes you're not going to succeed initially. But I'll tell you a little secret. The best way sometimes to get in is tempi. Julio's right. You absolutely have to start at the bottom. You know, there's no way, I mean, I, I get calls all the time from people saying, I want to get into production. Well, Julio's right. Everybody else does too. But there are certain temp agencies in the entertainment industry that are hired by the studios and networks for temporary jobs. So oftentimes what happens, and we talked about this, uh, Monica, and Monica and I talked about this too, is that sometimes, and I know this happened to me, when I was working on, on the Universal Studios lot, I, I, my secretary left and I called the temp agency, they brought a temp in. Well, guess what? The temp was there two or three weeks. I was too busy to kind of interview more people, so I wound up hiring the temp. So that's another way to get in the door sometimes, too. It's meeting as many people as you can and networking as much as you can. So there are a lot of ways to be able to get in, but you almost have to get somewhat creative when, in, in doing that. Can I, I just, I have to add this before I forget. One of the things that I'm seeing more and more is just, if you look across the whole media spectrum, it's the multi-platforms, right? How are people using all the platforms? So for example, um, the average person carries about four devices. I think by about 10 years, it's gonna be six devices that we carry. If you think of your own lives, what are all the devices you carry? So what's happening is the, tele the, the, the living room has changed, right? So now what's happening is you're watching a TV program and all of a sudden you're using Twitter to talk about the plot that was on the program. And then a commercial comes on and you're buying whatever brand of detergent they're selling you. So what I really encourage your daughter to do is figure out a marketing plan that is a multi-platform so that when she's going in for an interview, you know, the way, even the way you interview is different because you have to stand out, outside of what you have to stand out. If you think about the way all of us would interview, it's the kind of interview you take your notes, your resume. Well, now you have to make yourself memorable and you have to make yourself current and you have to make yourself relevant. And I think a lot of what's happening is a lot of the people haven't retooled with the industry, whether it's technology or, or media. So I ask her to make sure she's current and to actually build a marketing campaign that she can share. And there's a lot of best practices out there, but I think that that's going to make her memorable when you lead kind of a campaign that you've created. It may not be the greatest thing, but it shows that you've actually already put some thought. And if it's a certain company that she's interviewing, make sure she knows who's the president of the company and how she can integrate that into her campaign. Right. I really agree with that. Um, I will say as a parent, um, I, I joke about how I don't like my kids, but I, I like, <laughs> pretty like them very much. But um, one of the exercises that I make my kids do, and I, and I, I know because you're here asking the question for your daughter, is um, I believe that uh, one of the very helpful tools for most of the people, I've, I've made it a, a, my journey, my goal, to interview five of the people who I really admire in the, in the business. They're not all comedians, but they're all very, very successful. And one thing that they all had in common, which I thought was really interesting, was that they set a goal for what they wanted to do, and then they worked backwards, mm -hmm. all the way down to where they, where they began. And then they found, they made these roadmaps. They created these roadmaps of how to arrive where they wanted to go, um, and all the different avenues that it would take to get there. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to just sit down and, and map that out. I always, I am a firm believer, I'm a guerrilla filmmaker. I was not, I, there was a time where I wasn't working and I went out and made four movies of my own. I went and got the funding. And I, I think a production house, when someone says they want to be involved in anything about a movie, a, 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 a small production house is a very good place where you learn to go get coffee for everybody as well as, you know, um, having to hold the boom. Because everybody thinks they know exactly what they want to do when they graduate from college. And many of us, 
end up doing something completely different than what we said we wanted to do. We're just enamored with somebody else's results is usually what it is. Oh, they made Frozen, that's awesome, I can do that too. Then you go out and to work into a production house and you start working with the marketing team and then you fall in love with the audio process and then somebody shows you something on how to cut a film and you end up being an editor. And when you talk to people in the business, many of them will tell you, oh, I, I started off, I thought I wanted to be a director and I ended up doing color correction. Um, so I, I always recommend to start somewhere where you have an opportunity to see everything, the machine and how it works and be a part of everything. But I think it's so important. I won't, I, I, I'm, I'm very big on the, the goal aspect of how to make things happen and learning the journey. Because if you can map out where you're going, even though you don't go where you think you're going, you will eventually, your, your journey, having a map for your journey gives you a sense of power and direction. And I think it's very important to, for people that, especially when they graduate from school, because we, we all feel lost when we leave school. We all think. Hi, my name is Hedalia. I'm a freelance producer for Inside Look and Latino Voices. I also have articles there um, for Huffington Post. I wanted to ask you, especially Julio, um, about, you mentioned when people want to apply for jobs or you put jobs out there that you usually don't put it out there. That you usually, um, and, and I've heard a lot of people and a lot of people ask me this is, how can people find out about jobs that the entertainment industry have, has out there? Because I know, for example, I've heard uh, Sofia Vergara started an agency called Latino We, for example, and she's trying to help out Latino artists. So how can, not only Latinos, but how can people find out about jobs in the entertainment industry? Because it's really hard for someone to find those jobs that they want, especially even if you Google it, if you look around. Is it true that they keep it within the industry, or is it, is it a way for people to find out about the jobs? Or? Well, there's, there's actually three ways. And to take notes. No. <laughs> but uh, so the first point is there are jobs that exist online. And clearly, you know, the, the golden times of, of job fairs, you know, really don't God. exist as much because now everything's online, right? So there are positions that are online. You just got to know where to go. You know, there's, uh, and there's a lot of websites that uh, HR professionals will use that are within the industry that, you know, to help them you know, post their jobs that are more relevant to the job boards. Um, for example, uh, entertainmentcareers.net is one that comes to mind right away. And a lot of positions are posted. Indeed.com, for example, surprisingly, has a lot of great job postings there for uh, people looking to get into the industry. The reason why, uh, for example, the company that I'm at now, uh, you know, we, we kind of shy away from advertising it as a position within this company because otherwise, I, I have 800 resumes in my inbox now um, for one job. Just one job, and I've gone actually surprisingly through a lot of those. But you'd be surprised how quickly I go through those resumes. Click, 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 you just gotta go because you know what you're looking for. And that's a whole different conversation. But to go back to your question about you know, where, are the, where do these jobs exist, they exist online. Some of the more particular jobs, right, the more specific jobs that, uh, for example, you know, uh, looking for uh, an HR operations executive to work for this, you know, high profile production company. Well, you know, you're gonna want somebody from the industry to go into that position, and, or better yet, that's what they want. That's what they're looking for. So those positions tend to get shared amongst the networking, the, 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 the social networking that we've created in the industry. Um, some refer to it as the HR mafia, though I don't like saying it that. But you know, we do share a lot of positions, we share a lot of candidates, and, and so it's a, it's a, it's a robust uh, you know, community of, of folks that share positions kind of high profile positions. But for the most part, production jobs, agency jobs, you know, you can go onto some of these websites and find that there are some great opportunities out there, especially for someone that's trying to get into the industry. I think those are great to think, uh, you know, how you can break through. One thing to also keep in mind is even if you've never been or had a job within the industry, keep in mind what I call those transferable skills. You know, because like I said earlier, as Americans, we bounce around a lot. You know, the average American will change careers about five to six times in their lifetime. So when you think about that, you know, wherever you're at in your career, you want to move from banking to entertainment. Well, that's fine, and you can do it. I'm not saying it's not possible. You just got to really be mindful and, and, and ask yourself, well, how can I transfer those skill sets into this position? Mm -hmm. and, and what you may have to do is, and I know that was a question you had, is, you know, do I move to New York? Do I move to LA? And, and you know, how can I get more exposure into the industry by meeting people like ourselves here that can give you some pointers? 
you know, um, just by the nature of just being here. You know, I'd love to meet you. I'd give you my business card. If you're ever in L.A., give me a call. and We can always sit down and have a cup of coffee. I, I don't mind doing those things. Like I recognize that, you know, it's not easy to get into this industry. And the more you know, the more prepared you are when it comes to applying. Well, I also wanted to mention that we um, actually uh, distribute jobs through Imagen. That's right. Uh, our email is imagen.org. It's www.imagen.org. <laughs> I-M-A-G-E-N.org, and we send out lists about every two weeks on jobs that are in the industry that are shared with us by CBS and ABC and NBC. I've posted uh, with you guys, too. Yeah, yep. yeah, and, and at Nouveau TV, that's right, um, and now with Jerry Brookheim. Um, so that's one way. So we share that information uh, readily and willingly to anyone, you know, that, that, that needs it. And again, we also have lists, the list of the temp agencies. So if there's someone coming into town, I had a call not so long ago from an individual that um, was looking for a job, she wanted to get into production, and she said, what do I do? I said, look at the temp agencies. So we actually have a, a current list of temp agencies that, that you know, are always interviewing folks you know, uh, to, to be placed on temporary jobs in the, in the entertainment industry. So, um, so through our organization, we can certainly be helpful in that way. Well, thank you for putting this together. This is a great panel, so I do appreciate that. Um, I have the privilege to represent more than 100 uh, business owners in the area. I'm the president of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce here in Montgomery County. And uh, I like everything that I have heard, but I would like to highlight two points that you made, uh, that you made before, and it is show and then the, the word business. Uh, definitely in the industry, there are many things to share with other type of businesses, not just uh, the, the, the show business. So I would like to ask, um, what is the best way that non-entertainment business owners can get in contact with this show business that is champion in marketing and the need that many other business owners have in that type of, of um, uh, skill, marketing and networking that is so important? And um, the second part has to do with, as you mentioned, Monica, it has to do with the speed that this um, new marketing digital era is making people thinking that we are up date today and tomorrow we are not. So. Um, I would like, if I could, just to, with regard to the businesses, um, uh, procurement. You know, uh, I think that that's something that, uh, that small business owners can look at. Uh, I know that the studios and networks, you know, contract out all kinds of goods and services. And some of the criteria for them getting the contracts is are they uh, subcontracting with minority um, uh, subcontractors. So it's a tremendous opportunity. And I have to tell you that everybody is looking at the Latino market right now, looking at Latino businesses. I can tell you that at PBS here, National PBS in Crystal City, is now looking to establish a procurement program. Uh, for small businesses in the D.C. area. So that would be one that you might uh, want to, to look forward to. It's not going to be a lot of money annually, but it's something, and it's, and it's a start. So procurement certainly is a good way to be able to, to get in the door for small businesses. I mean, and in, in, ter in terms of just the speed of technology, I, I just think every network, every uh, studio it's trying to figure out really how to tap into it. So my recommendation to you is just, you have to get into it yourself. I mean, one of the things that's the hardest part is that we're so accustomed to the way that we've done things for, for 20 years, for 15 years. Um, and it forces us to get uncomfortable, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But one of the challenges is that because it's moving so fast, and from us from a measurement standpoint, if we are not using all of the technology at the speed that it is, then we're no longer relevant. So you don't want to make yourself where you are irrelevant anymore. You have to make yourself constantly current. And that means forcing yourself to understand technology, you yourself doing it. So for example, when I used to work at Telemundo, we used to be selling telenovelas. Well, it was really difficult for me to understand how you can sell if you never watch the telenovela yourself, right? Or if you want to win the lottery, you're not going to win it unless you buy a ticket. You don't even have a chance. <laughs> So for me, it's constantly getting connected to the devices uh, if you want to get into this industry and if it's production or if it's a network to understand how they are reaching these devices. Um, I'm constantly learning. I don't know them all, but I know that I have to be. Even my company, one of the things that they've asked us to do is 
uh, they said, well, do you have a social uh, persona? I was like, no, I come out of politics. You're not supposed to have a social persona if you're on the backside, right? So this whole concept of having a social persona, I didn't. But I realized that if I'm going to be talking about digital, I probably do need a Twitter handle. And I, I didn't want to do it because I wanted to remain private. But you absolutely have to know the vines of the world. You have to know the Hulus. You have to know the Rokus. You have to understand this if you're going to be part of the industry. Because then you can't even have a conversation with them. Yeah. I uh, also, from an artistic standpoint, I, I know that one of the great connectors of, um, I've, I've done a lot of events. As a stand-up comedian, I do a lot of corporate stuff. Um, causes are great connectors between mm. corporations and the entertainment entities, um, especially a lot of actors, um, people that love animals. End up, um, I have friends who are on the Sons of Anarchy that are very involved with a lot of corporations to go out and speak on, on behalf of causes. And I, I just think that causes are great connectors for people that come from the different realms because everybody, um, as an actress, I have a, a corporation that I have to, you know, I have to be, as a human being, I have to be involved in certain causes just so, so for my own personal fulfillment. Many actors, many entertainers, many corporations um, are connected through causes. And I think that with the Chamber of Commerce and Simi Valley, I, I've done, in California, I've done several things that brought together uh, Nestle uh, with a, a television show and, um, and, and a major bank. Um, and we all, all worked together for one cause. And a lot of great things happened as a result of that union um, with, especially for me as a comedian, because now I do the corporate uh, comedy show for the, one of the corporations yearly. They bring me in to, to do a comedy show. Um, and my friend's organization has a, a partner that, that is sponsoring them to go out and go rescue dogs. So I, I think that Causes is also a very good way to connect the worlds. Uh, muchas gracias por su presentación. Um, es para mí un gusto. Preguntarles un poco más. And the question is, um, well, before I, let me tell you, I am Alvaro de Moya, and I speak Spanish and not some English as you, one of you said, um, what is, how is the Spanish language, how welcoming, uh, how influential is that of being bilingual in Hollywood and, 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 and your, uh, your industry, um, Ida and Julio, Julio and, and, and Monica, um, how is it that people there in, those, in, those, uh, in, in that industry is welcoming, you're saying, Perhaps we have all this audience there that's growing by leaps and bounds. How, how much can we use the language, the Spanish language, so we can even connect with a greater audience? If I could, I'd, I'd just yes. like to say that one of the reasons Imagen was born uh, 20, 30 years ago was because the impact... Um, there was little, if any, impact on English language media, which really affects the masses. In my experience in working in television, I was vice president of public affairs for a television company. And I was able to meet with special interest groups across the country in terms of their issues and causes and making sure that the writers on each of our television shows had story, new story ideas to write episodes about different um, issues that the country was facing. It was somehow, you know, issues relating to the Latino community was never on, on the front burner. Primarily because most of the people in Hollywood, the writers, the producers, and the directors, thought, oh, they all watch Spanish language television. So, you know, so then, you know, Norman thought about, and, and he and I would have many discussions about, well, how do you begin to change those perceptions? And one of the ways you change those perceptions is to be one of them, to be the writers, to be the producers, to be the directors, so that you really can influence how Latinos are being portrayed on television, primarily in the English language. I remember one time I was um, uh, organizing a factory in Indiana, and um, I went to a house call uh, an African-American family, and um, I walked in and I introduced myself and they were very wonderful, wonderful family. And 
I started out by saying, you know, well, you know, you know, the Mexican American community has really difficult time as well, you know, in terms of 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 inclusion and you know the civil rights movement and so forth. And the grandfather looked at me and said, "Are you a Mexican?" And I said, "Yeah." He says, "I've never seen a real Mexican before." <laughs> he says, "How come you don't have long hair? How come you don't have braids?" You know, uh, where's your sarape? You know, it's that they had a stereotype that had been created by television and film of what Mexicans look like. And that was in 1978 when I had that experience. So as, you know, three years later, I wound up working in the industry. And when you think about what Norman Lear did, he changed the face of television. And he made people, you know, uh, you know kind of fess up to their discriminatory practices about who they really were. And so if you really want to make an impact in terms of our community, it's being there on the front line and being the successful producers, being the Guillermo del Toros and being the Robert Rodriguez's and being the Kenny Ortega's who is called the billion dollar man with a B, I might add, by the Walt Disney Company for high school musicals. So it's to me, it's more about branching out. It's not just about, just about Spanish language because in my opinion, we're there. It's looking at how everybody else sees us and I might add, how we see ourselves. Because I think it's really important for our children to have a very positive image of who, who we are, especially as what they see on television and film, and now what they see on all the social media platforms as well. So she speaks um, from, um, from that perspective, and, I, and she and I have this conversation all the time. She's like the godmother of everybody on this panel, and I would not have hosted those Imagen Awards had it mm -hmm. not been for her. Um, what happens is exactly what she's saying. Spanish has been very embraced very much in Hollywood, but sometimes it's been embraced for the purpose of reinforcing stereotypes. So when I go into an audition now, they ask me, can you do the Sofia Vergara thing? And, and my response is, I'm not from Colombia. I can't, you know, I, I, I didn't date Tom Cruise. Like, I can't do the Sofia Vergara thing, but I can do the Aida Rodriguez thing. Um, Spanish for me is a blessing because I can do, I do stand up in two languages. Mm -hmm. uh, it creates a different marketplace for me because I can go audition for Spanish speaking television. Although, because I am tall and Latinos are like, you're too tall to be a Latino on TV, <laughs> so it's really weird. But um, like she said, we're there. Spanish has been embraced in, in Hollywood. They are creating bilingual programming as mm -hmm. we speak. Um, there are television shows that are going to be. Like, I don't know if anybody knows Que Pasa USA, yeah. and it was a bilingual show. Um, they're actually headed in that direction as well. I think Spanish, you know, has, it, it's, it's inevitable. I mean, whether you embrace it or not, Spanish is not going anywhere. Right. But I do think it's, that it's very important that we are seeing beyond being housekeepers, uh, we, are being seen, we are being seen okay. mastering the language that is English without having to incorporate Spanish for survival. Um, when we are able to do that, I think it's very important to, to master the language in, in, in both languages, uh, not to be, because I, I think that we drive what they think, of, how, how they mm -hmm. think about us and how they see us, and it's and very important. I have a lot of thoughts on language because we measure on language. Um, and I am, the way that I say it, I'm the 200% American. I'm 100% American, 100% Latina, and I choose when to speak, what language, under what circumstance, in what room, and I am lucky because I get a chance to do that. So my thoughts on language are this. Um, it's no longer either or, it's and, um, or both. And the way that, that, that I see it is there's always going to be, well, currently in the United States, there's 40% of the population that only speaks Spanish. They're not going anywhere. But you know what? That other 60%, is increasingly becoming more bilingual. They're speaking more English. So you cannot ignore either more. America, the United States now, speaks at least two languages. And that's just the way it's gonna be. That is the mainstream. We are the mainstream now. So I think that one of the things we have to figure out is how to use language to help either brands or to help television. I think people are still trying to figure it out from what I've seen on the research industry. Um, we're doing studies on trying to understand the bilingual brain. But the way that I see it is that we are innately ambicultural. 
That means that we seamlessly transcend between cultures without even thinking about it. So we have to help companies become ambicultural as well to help us understand when, if you're a brand, if you're a marketer, if you're a network, or a movie studio, is when we choose to go see movies in English and when we choose to go see it in Spanish. And it's not either or anymore. And I think as I see language evolving, you know, you see also Spanglish and how does Spanglish play a role in it. I think you're seeing it more, you're seeing more of kind of people trying this bilingual opportunity, but at the end of the day, we're both. And I think companies are beginning to understand it, but everything that my colleagues have said is, is 100%. I, I, am, uh, I speak Spanish fluently, and it's been a plus for me. I also want to put a plug in for a show that is starring one of our good friends that is bilingual, Jane the Virgin. I don't know if mm -hmm. any of you have seen Jane the Virgin on the CW network. Gina Rodriguez is the um, is the star of that show, and she and and it's with the uh, Spanish subtitles. So if you haven't caught it, you may want to take a look at it. Yeah, it's pretty good. Nada. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Jessica Lawson, and my question is primarily towards Julio. You would said how when a job opens up, you have 800 plus people trying to say, "I want that job." How do you make yourself stand out in that? Yeah, good question. That's a great question. You know, how how does a candidate st make themselves stand out? From the rest, and quite frankly, there's there's no real way to stand out. How can I say this? You, you know, not to say that that someone who's representing a company won't be impressed by the measures you'll take to get noticed, but there is a line, right? Mm -hmm. And and you can only take so much. I mean, I, I've gotten so many calls by one candidate. I mean, to the point where you're harassing to try to get that position. It's not not the way to go about trying to get noticed. The way to get noticed, I think, is you know, how well you present your resume, first and foremost, right? So start from the beginning. You know, how are you presenting yourself on paper? That's, that's the way to go, because otherwise, you're going to apply for that job, and I'm going to quickly pass, pass you up as I go into the next candidate. There's got to be something on that resume that makes you stand out, right? Whether it's your experience, whether how well you crafted that, that resume, um, and then secondly, if you're going to apply, then how do you follow up? You know, how do you make, if, if you're being told to apply online and you're, now you're feeling, okay, I got, a, I got a job rec ID number on me, so what does that mean? And, and who in that, you know, let's say Warner Brothers, for example, you know, big operation there. If you're trying to get a job within Warner Brothers Studio, you know, how do I go about, in, you know, getting, getting in touch with the HR team so that I can find out whether or not, sadly, you know what, the truth of the matter is, if they were going to get, they would have to hire someone full time just to go and confirm people's, you know, resume. So. It's a, it's a tricky w a way to answer this because there's really no real way to stand out other than once you've landed that r interview and really focus on how you're going to come across in that interview. You know, it, it's about knowing, it's about going back to that, that, that reassurance, that confidence that you want to bring. And, and let's not fool ourselves. You know, it is, it's a personality issue as well. You've got to be likable. You've you, you, you got to impress someone in your interview. Your skills can only get you so far, you know. And the other half of that is doing your research, as, as Monica had mentioned. You know, you've got to do your research. If, if you don't believe in the brand, for example, and if you don't necessarily like television or film, and here you're going to just to get in there, you, you're not going to fully impress. I, now on the other hand, have met some great candidates who you can just tell eat, breathe, and sleep film, eat, breathe, and you know, sleep uh, entertainment, media, social media, what have you. And it just comes across when you're talking to somebody. See, my, my approach to interviewing has always been this. And I explained this to Mr. Bruckheimer during my interview. You know, I don't believe in the Q&A process. I don't believe in reading down a list of questions. You know, it's about getting to know the candidates. So organically, you know, in a conversation, those things will come up. You know, things about your interests, about the film industry, about the talents, about the history, about whatever, the numbers, whatever you want to talk about. So long as you are speaking with conviction and passion, that's going to draw me into closer to wanting to talk to you a little bit further. Or maybe say, you know what, she was likable, she, she obviously knew the business. I, I, I want to I continue this conversation. I'm going to patch her resume through to my hiring manager and let them you know, figure out if there's a, a compatibility there. So again, going back to how do you make yourself stand out? Listen, I've, gotten, I've had people send me fruit baskets, you know, follow up. I do not eat it, OK? I, I thank you, you know, um, cookies and, and whatnot. Don't, don't do that. You know, because you want to you want, you want to stay focused on the position. And quite frankly, my job is to hire the most qualified person for that position. At the end of the day. Can I ask you a question? Is yes, there a question that you ask 
that is just you're always going to ask that they should know? There's a few. Yeah, there are a few. Um, you know, one of them is, so So how? So tell me, I, and I always want to know this about any, any candidate. So you know, what, what's, your, what's your career path? You know, where, where, are you, where are you going? How do you see this position helping you in that, in that, in that, in that you know, direction? And if someone can answer that because they're thinking, well, it seems like a cool company and Jennifer Lopez happens to be the chief creative officer and I'm a big fan of Jennifer Lopez, that's not going to do it, you know? Or people who's, you know what's interesting, people will send me a, a headshot with their resume and thinking, <laughs> wrong, wrong. <laughs> Listen, an interview and an audition are, are somewhat the same, but they're, they are different, different, you know? So I don't want to see your face before you come into the interview. I want to <laughs> focus on the skills that are written on paper because then that's going to lead me to ask you more questions. Now, the questions again, you know, let's talk about your career path and, and, and why would you want to work here? What can you tell me about this company and what, what excited you about applying? You know, because really what I'm trying to get to, as I said earlier, is your interests, your passions, your genuine interests in the position. Because people can tell me all day long that they're fans of Mr. Borkheimer's work, and I understand that because so was I, and that's why I applied. But more than that, it's about, well, what, what can you do to help us even elevate higher? What can you do to contribute to our team? And quite frankly, it's, it's a winning team. It's been proven. So, you know, you got to tell me something more that's going to make you stand out. And what are you going to ask when you're in your interview? Because those are the people that stand out. That's right. You know, um, he's interviewing you just as much as you're interviewing him. Mm -hmm. Because if you believe that you are of such value, then... Why, what can they do for you? And why do they think they deserve you? I mean, you don't want to ask it that way. Right. You know, but just, um, I, I, I'm a firm believer in that and, and always asking your own questions that you come into your interviews with. Have those ready, for sure. And I, and I, it's funny you, you brought that up because I'm very much aware of that when we go into an interview. And I mean, just to put the candidate at ease, I will say, listen, you know, it, we're at a crossroads here. You're, you should be interviewing me as much as I'm interviewing you. And, and if I'm going to put that game face on to sell you on my position and sell you on the company, whichever company that is, you know, I want you to really make a, a true assessment of whether or not you find yourself truly working there, right? Because I think it was Julio that mentioned something about PBS. It's culture. You know, I, I'm a true believer, and this is just because this is what I do for a living. I, I'm passionate about creating a cohesive environment, building a strong A team. You know, creating a, a, an environment, a culture that fosters growth and creativity and all those great things, right? So you too should be doing your research on, hmm, okay, well, you know, Google. Everybody wants to work at Google. Well, why is that? Well, they have a great product, one, but they have a work, wonderful uh, you know, work-life balance. And they provide wonderful benefits and perks to those team members. And because they want you to work and they want you to stay. That's what makes it much more competitive. But if that's where you want to go, or similar companies, then you should start doing your research. And, and interviewing. I, and I do a couple of things too. So when I'm looking to hire, like I love that uh, Julio, you have a story. I'm always looking to know what is your story and your passion really comes out and through yes. it. So I'm looking for passion. The other thing is we talked a little bit about arrogance. I don't hire arrogant people, period. I, I can smell them in a second. Right. I do hire confident people, but I don't hire arrogant people. So because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to manage energy. Right. So I don't necessarily manage people. I manage the energy that they bring and do they fit in the culture. And the question I always ask at the end is, what are three things that uh, you're, that, what are three things, well, I have multiple <clears throat> questions, but one of the questions I always ask is, what are three things that people that don't like you would say about you? It shocks them because they're kind of like, <laughs> what is like, it? And then the question that I asked when I was interviewed, I said, what am I inheriting that you need to hire me for? Like, I could do this job, but what am I inheriting that comes with it? So that I'm very clear and I have clarity, but I definitely don't don't hire arrogant. I could smell it in a second. That's a really good question. What am I inheriting? Right. <laughs> I asked, yeah. Before good. you get to the interview phase, I just got a little um, uh, just uh, tips, and that is everybody's hiring, <laughs> taking resumes online now. So you know you have to get your resume in in order to be able to get that interview with mm -hmm. Julio or Monica or or anyone else. Read the job description. <laughs> The job description will give you hints on what you need to say in your application. Or resume. Or, in or your resume. Right? Absolutely. Or, in, right? Absolutely. or even Absolutely. as an actress, read the breakdown. That's the job description. A lot of people, I can't tell you when I was casting my movie and I was very specific with my breakdown, there was a very specific, and one of the girls that came to audition had just graduated from Stanford and she really thought she was amazing. 
and she came in and auditioned for the role of a heavyset black woman. And she was blonde, blue eyes, size zero. And, and it wasn't because she thought she was such a great actress that she was gonna book the role. It's because she didn't bother to read the breakdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, job description, all of that stuff is uh, reading. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody that <laughs> read my entire bio and she knew everything about me, which I thought, you know what, okay, you know, that was kind of cool. She kind of knew everything about right, me. Right, right, no, that is yeah. true. That is anyway, well, I think we're out of time. Well, thank you very much, you've been a great audience. Oh, you know, it's, we're, we're talking about how you stand out, right? And here's a lost art for those that, us, you know, that do interview. You'd be surprised what a simple thank you note, a handwritten thank you note yes. can do to make you stand out. Don't forget that. Nowadays, everyone just wants to shoot a quick email because it's, it's the quicker, you know, most convenient thing. But who doesn't want to get a you know, handwritten letter or a card in the mail or even at work? So you know, keep that in mind. Papyrus card's always beautiful, right? So uh, you know, those are always nice to send out. And no Helen. <laughs> and what's that? And no Helen. <laughs> no Helen, right. Helen changed. Thank you, guys. Thank you so hey, thank much. Thank you Pleasure. very much. Thank you.